Welcome to Decoding the Code, the YouTube show for developers. Get ready for your host, Mark Backus. Hello, I'm Mark, the host of Decoding the Code. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel. Since I'm a small content creator, that means a lot to me. So please consider doing it and uh, enjoy the show. Hello and welcome everyone to Decoding the Code. Today we are going to talk uh, what is accessibility and why you should care. Today we have Jack Domleo as a guest speaker. He's from Nottingham, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, he's front-end developer. He works a lot with Vue.js and Nuxt. And he uh, he likes working with accessibility. Uh, hey Jack, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Uh, I love being on the on these shows, and uh, I like to watch these shows as well. I think they're fantastic. All right. So um, just to clear some things up, um, this uh, accessibility it's written A eleven Y. And many, I, I saw three different ways people pronounce it, like accessibility, which I think is the right way, and then ally, and then A11Y. That's, that's somehow how I pronounce it in my head when I read it, but is the pr correct pronunciation is, I assume, accessibility, right? Yeah, it is. So uh, it's quite a weird, um, a weird um, acronym, an um, ally, uh, as I like to say. Uh, it's a it's a strange one because uh, it kind of works backwards. So if you put a screen reader over that um, acronym, it reads out A eleven Y, uh, yeah, and obviously okay. that kind of contradicts yeah. the whole uh, idea, <laughs> oh. right, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's like A eleven letters and then a the Y. All right. Yeah. Okay, so um, before we come to uh, a little bit your expertise, I just want to v go very quickly in, in the basics um, so the audience uh, knows what this is about. So can you explain what uh, accessibility is in some simple terms? And what does so, it include, what doesn't? Yeah, so basically um, it's everything and nothing on <laughs> a web page. Um, it can make and break uh, a website, uh, whether you get customers or not, or whether your users find it easy or not. Um, including accessible features is for every user that uses your website or your web application. Um, it's not just for a small number of users. Now, depending on what kind of features you, you decide to um, add in, obviously it depends on what kind of groups of people you focus on most. Uh, but you know, like a normal person like me and you, uh, having an accessible website is still important because uh, we need to be able to use that website and interact and read uh, the content as well. Okay, so basically it's that everyone can um, operate a website or an app for that matter. Um, no, uh, not important, like which uh, uh, abilities they have or which mm. disabilities. Yeah, so it, it's quite difficult to write an inaccessible website. Yeah. Uh, but I guess we'll get into that at some point. Yeah. Um, you know, it's important for um, people who are able and people who aren't able to do certain things, uh, people who can see quite well are still going to have issues with your website and people who can't see quite well are going to have issues. So uh, it covers 100% yeah. of people. Okay. Uh, so now that we know um, basically what accessibility is, uh, tell us a little bit about your work with accessibility in your job and maybe uh, even on some... Uh, fun projects uh yes yeah, so, how, how is your work with accessibility yeah so um, as a front-end dev uh for a company that, that cares about getting lots of customers to their site um 
it's important uh, for me to, to try and make our website as accessible as possible with the kind of like uh, time strings um, I've got. Um, so whenever we're making new components, um, I always try and uh, not just make like basic components. I, I try and do a lot of research into how I can make these accessible. I use a screen reader um, on them and stuff. Um, I will implement um, apps. So apps is a tool to test uh, uh, to test the accessibility on your okay. website. Uh, I will uh, I've embedded that into our automated testing. Oh, nice. That, yeah, so it doesn't catch on everything. Uh, I put a tweet out a couple of days ago that said, um, automated tests will only capture about 30% of excess, uh, will only capture 30% of um, alley um, issues. Um, so it's a nice thing to have because it captures um, obvious stuff. Uh, but, you know, there's still some um, other things that we need to do. Uh, and if we ever get, like, concerns about a certain web page, I'll go through that web page, you know, I'll unplug my mouse, for example, make sure that mm -hmm. someone can actually use it. Um, if we notice something wrong with the contrast, we'll hand that over to the uh, designers in the company uh, and we'll kind of like show them proof that, you know, they need to fix some things about it. Uh, okay. So I do kind of use it like every day um, in my uh, job. And outside of uh, of work, though, it it's actually quite fun. So uh, I sometimes like to make code pen uh, and just like put random components in these code pens I make, um, and I'll try and make them accessible and purely focus on that. Um, oh, and nice. it's yeah, and it's a really good kind of like learning curve, especially for people who are coming across these components for the, the first time. Like seeing all these extra bits that they could add to their components, uh, they find it quite um, interesting. Uh, and I think maybe a point that you were trying to get to was a uh, was it my open source package I've got? Uh, so I've got a open source uh, tool. Uh, it's a, a okay. CSS only tool, and it's called Check Alley. Uh, okay, well, what does it, it do? Is, yeah, so it, it's not powerful. Uh, all it is is it is a style sheet uh, with lots of different selectors on there, and these selectors are made uh, to try and find um, alley and issues. So, for of a very basic example, um, a image without an out without oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, without an alt text uh, that's not accessible. So in the style sheet, we put um, image and then not, and then like alt. So that selector basically, basically says, can you find an image that doesn't have any alt text? And then for the actual style, oh, nice. we'll put like a, a red border around that and it gets flagged up. Uh, it's quite a popular learning resource. Um, it's not used as like, the go-to tool, uh, but it's a really good thing, uh, a really good one for people to actually learn on, uh, and it's been popular over like the past six months or so. Well, nice. Um, later, you you send me the um, link to that, and I will uh, link it in the description for um, the people that are watching and listening to um, to check out your uh, your repo and maybe they they find something in interesting there. Sounds good. Um, all right, and um, what are some uh, common um, accessibility mistakes that um, that people make when developing web websites? Cool. So uh, there's quite a lot, and you know, kind of the actual mistake itself depends on what kind of person you are. So I'm a front end dev, but I'm not very good when it comes to to uh, uh, to designing an actual website, mm -hmm. so all of the alley makes that I that I'll make 
uh, what all of the common ones I'll make would be things like uh, contrast. So I'm, I'm not very good at picking mm-hmm. the right colors. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm not very good at like making components, like have a shadow, for example. And mm-hmm. uh, sometimes I can make them so that you can't differentiate between certain things. So like those are definitely that definitely the common ones I mean. Um, so, and I guess that that's quite common with a lot of people as well. Um, some other mistakes. So, uh, some content people, for example, if they are um, editing a blog, for example, they may add um, an image, but you know it might not spring to mind that they need to add alt text to that um, image. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, depending on the kind of person, you know they may miss out uh, that stuff. Um, other stuff is uh, a bit more complex, you know, not taking, uh, not considering the fact that people may use a screen reader. Uh, okay. Now that one's quite advanced uh, and there's a lot of discussion as to how this should work. So um, acronyms, they don't get read out that well by a screen reader um, okay. and there's a debate right now as to whether you should uh, force a screen reader to read something else out. Now, the people who are for that say that you know, that gives them a better experience because it reads the word out as it was meant yes. to be. Uh, the people who are against it are saying you shouldn't be giving uh, screen reader users a different experience because you're treating them differently. So it, it, it's okay. quite, yeah, so it's quite, a awkward um, argument, um, but <laughs> uh, actually, it, it is a good point that you brought um, it up. Um, something that I like to do is search um, online. Uh, just search uh, common mistakes that are made, and I'll go and read all of these ar- articles. And because I know that they are common mistakes, I'll try to not make them in the future. So uh, it's a really good thing actually to uh, read if you have the time. Okay. Yeah. Nice. I remember when I made my website, um, I I had troubles with the contrast ratio, and mm-hmm. I spent like more than an entire day on just picking the colors. So oh, the, wow. at at least the uh, Google Lighthouse test would pass, and I would get close to a hundred accessibility rating mm-hmm. at least on um, on the Google Lighthouse score. But um, what else is there that the lighthouse uh, test doesn't cover? I, I I heard that like um, yeah, y- your website can pass a hundred percent lighthouse score, and it's still very not accessible. Um, do you have some uh, examples for that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, I may not have uh, examples because uh, all of these websites are changing all the time. You know, scores kind of vary. Uh, each week as uh, people yeah. work on these websites or date them. Uh, but um, if you have a 100% score on Lighthouse, for example, or if you write tests uh, using apps, uh, you know, the, these tools, um, a side fact, uh, the Google Lighthouse actually uses apps under Oh, nice. the hood. Yes. Yeah, so uh, if you get um, 100%, then that is really, really good, like that is a win-win because that means that Google hasn't managed to spot any obvious um, errors on your um, application. The bit where it gets a little bit complex is when you start making all your custom components. So when yeah. it, when it, when a native um, element doesn't exist uh, and you have to make a custom component, um, Google actually doesn't know what you were intended to make in the first place. Uh, so if you were making a combo box, for example, uh, you might put a roll of combo box on there. Yeah. But Google doesn't know whether you intended to make a combo box or not. And then it doesn't know how everything links. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, so it, it is something that they are working on. Uh, they are putting a lot of uh, encouragement on the devs to write their own uh, tests around this, make sure that they're 
and parents are doing what they expected to. Uh, so that's where the confusion comes in. Is that it's a really smart tool, and if you get one hundred percent, then that's fantastic. Uh, but if you do have custom components in your website, which a lot of websites do, uh, then that's where it gets caught out. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. And um, I remember reading uh, when I looked a little bit into the topic about the different levels of accessibility, A, AA, and AAA. Um, can you tell us a little bit uh, what are these levels and what are they for? So these levels, you can think of them as like a school grade. Um, mm -hmm. You will want to try and get as many A's as you can. Um, now, depending on your country, uh, depending on what kind of sector your business is in, um, or if you're just doing a side project, then laws don't apply to you. Uh, but for example, if you're living in the UK and you're a public sector uh, company, you've got to meet those AAA standards. Okay. Uh, that they set. Now, this is actually a new law. It, it only came in in October. Um, and that applies to websites and mobile applications as well. Um, okay. But cool. it, it, it basically defines the kind of levels. Now, mostly it applies to the color contrast. So mm. if you've got black text on a white background, that's, you know, that's like the most contrast that you actually can have. Um, if you've got gray text on a black background, that'll be harder to read. So then you start going down uh, those A's. Um, at the at the, the least, if you're building like a personal project and you, you want to try and practice these things, you should at least try and aim for the single A standards. Okay. They're not they're not very hard to meet. Um, you can do them quite um, easily, uh, and there's a lot of of resources out there to, to help you choose the right colors if you yeah. need to. And there's a lot of resources like tell you how to choose the right colors if you need to. Um, if you are using native um, elements and you're writing semantic uh, HTML uh, and your website speed is fairly quick, then you, you're guaranteed to be in one of those bands. Okay, great. All right, so it's like a um, a ranking on how accessible your site is, and then there there are some um, regulations which which type of sites or which type of entities should meet which um, which type of or which level of accessibility. Yeah, I should um, also add uh, when, you know, like for example, if you're a public sector company. Uh, when your your site goes through testing, um, they don't just put a grade on your entire site. Um, they'll put grades on very specific things. So they'll go okay. through your components and they'll put grades on your components. And then they'll go through the actual colors you've chosen and they'll put grades on the contrast uh, of those. Uh, then they'll go through the actual content and stuff. They'll go through the website speed uh, because if you've got a slow website that's uh, classes um, inaccessible yeah. and they'll put grades on that uh, and then you know they'll kind of round them all up to give you a overall grade uh, so that makes it easier for people making websites because they can because then yeah. they know exactly where they need to improve on yeah that's great um and you mentioned a uh, semantic html um, can you elaborate a little bit um, what is important when you write HTML that is semantic, which translates to accessibility? Yeah, okay. So if you don't write semantic HTML, I'll start there. If you don't write semantic HTML and you just put divs um, all over the place, um, technically you're not breaking any accessibility. Um, but what you have got is you've got a lot of meaningless tags in your HTML that don't tell the user um, anything. Um, if you use the wrong tags, 
Um, I'll go there next. So if you've got uh, a anchor tag uh, and you actually wrap this around a button, for mm -hmm. example, this isn't semantic. So uh, according to the HTML standards, you can't wrap a button inside a anchor tag. Uh, so this is where you're starting to break this semantic structure. Um, writing semantic HTML, but that that's that's a different ball game to kind of breaking it. So uh, there's a lot of tags out there that um, exist that give the user a lot of information for you. So the basic ones are header, main, mm -hmm. and a What's that? Uh, and these basically tell the user where they are in the, 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 the application. And it, it helps them navigate through your website and easily. Uh, nav is one that, that tells them that they're using the, the main nav bar that is available. Um, using a button rather than a div with a unclick event. Um, you know, that's more semantic because you're using the correct okay. element. And, you know, for example, a screen reader, uh, I keep using that as an example. A screen reader will actually tell the user that this is a button. Um, if you put a div with a unclick, it won't, on most of them, won't tell them that this is a button. Um, but if you put the role of a button on that div, so role is is a attribute that can be applied to um, any tag and it basically changes the behavior okay. of that um, element uh, ideally they should only be applied to divs and spans um, but if you put uh, the role of a button up um, on to a div with a on click event then technically this is you know semantic uh, because you've told this div to be a button um, so yeah, so I, I think starting with the, the fact that if you just use divs, that's fine, but you know, you've just got a very bog standard website, uh, it's gonna be very difficult to use. If you start breaking semantics. Yeah. Uh, it's also d d difficult, for example, to find out for the user um, where where is the content that I'm interested in. So exactly. what's the domain and then the article tags? It, it's um, I don't know if the um, on the tab there is some some sort of order for um, or priority for those kind of tags. But at least the user knows. Oh yeah, this is main. This is important. This is where my content will be. Um, I think exactly. that, that's, not, that's not one of the things that uh, that I know to be uh, important for uh, HTML um, markup. Mm. Yeah, it's a it, it it's a huge park, uh, but uh, you know, I don't know um, every uh, tag that um, exists. You know, I find out new tags um, every day. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, there are new tags being invented for you know very specific components, uh, so that's also good to see as well. Yeah, you, you think you know HTML, and then you see someone on Twitter write about like an element or an, a tag that you've never seen before, and you're like, "What? I thought I knew this kind of stuff, but apparently yeah. I don't." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I see those tweets and all the time. I'm like, "Wow, that is." <laughs> I, you know, I've learned something new just scrolling through tweets. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and then you, you go into your uh, you, you code editor or on, on your um, sandbox somewhere and then you try it out and like, oh man, I did not mm. know this. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, would you have some tips that on how you could convince a manager, product leader, um, or management in general um, to reserve some budget for accessibility or to um, to take the time for accessibility? Because there's often the the um, problem that management is, is like, oh no, um, 
we have too much to do. We need to make features, features, features. But what would some um, uh, some arguments be for those decision makers to take accessibility a little bit more serious? So I, I think in this topic, this is one of the like more difficult uh, kind of things that, that the devs have to do. Uh, so, um, as a dev, you want to write, you know, the best code that yeah. you can write. As a business, they just want you to write code. And um, if it works, they're happy if it works. Um, so, I'm going to split up this answer uh, into two parts. So, the first part, if you're a small business, you've got a small team, or if you are a startup, um, when you're designing your actual applications in the first place, design them so that your components can be made using native um, elements. Mm -hmm. If you've got to create your own custom components, one, you've got to find time to make those custom components. Uh, two, you've got to test that those custom components work. Uh, and three, if you rushed making those components and you didn't make them as accessible as you could do, uh, usually it doesn't take a lot of work to make them accessible, but it does take a lot of research to make them uh, accessible. If you don't do that, then you could potentially be losing customers, whereas using the native element uh, for your type of business would have been the quicker and the easier approach at that time. As you grow, then you can start adding components. What if my manager asks me like, oh, Mark, you're taking three days for this simple component. Why do you need so much time? And I, w I would answer, I want to make it accessible. But they are like, but, but what does it bring me um, business-wise? How, well, how could I convince him uh, these are some reasons why it's important to make our website or our application accessible. So sometimes you will meet those people. Uh, and I think you've got to come to some kind of level ground. So you, and as a dev, you know, you want to do this thing because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. You want to write the best code. Then as a business person, they want to get features out as quick as they can because that's what it's going to pay their bills. Um, you can't you know, completely understand their point of view and they can't, can't completely understand your point of view. So I think all that would take would be like a little conversation where you um, estimate how long you think it'll be. Um, you tell them the risks. Uh, so for example, if you finish the component now uh, and you didn't spend that extra time on it, what risk does that bring to the business? And then I would let them decide on that. Yeah. Um, if they decide, you know, it's fine, we're happy to take those risks, then I think it's acceptable to leave it uh, because uh, I, don't, uh, I don't want to be the one to tell you to argue with the people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, like it, it, it's not your business. So they take the decisions. And if that's the end decision, then um, I, I think as a developer, you have to live with it. But you can always try to convince them, right? Yeah, yeah, you can. And then, as you uh, say it with, with the conversation and um, yeah. make them try to understand um, your point of view. Yeah, and then make sure you add it to the backlog uh, if you've got, got time yeah. later to come back to these components. And um, add them, uh, and I, I guess that that actually applies to um, any size business, really. Whether you are a small startup or whether you're an um, Amazon, uh, you know, kind of making sure that that it's at least noted down somewhere that certain things need to come back to, and that yeah. it's noted down somewhere that people have agreed the risks that they are going to take. Um, 
I keep saying risks, like, you know, it's a really, really bad thing. Uh, <laughs> by risks, I mean, you know, you could lose some customers. There's no exact figure on like how many customers yeah. you could lose. It you know, completely depends on what your website does. Um, but um, it could be as bad as going to a lawsuit, for example. So um, anyone oh, visiting, yeah. yes. So um, anyone visiting your website, they can't use it effectively, and they can prove they can't use it effectively. Um, they actually have the right to take you to court and create a lawsuit and, um, out of it, which has happened to a few companies in the past. Uh, I won't name them to to kind of keep the shame yeah. away f- from them, but uh, if you want to go and research that, just search um, Ali lawsuits and you'll uh, find lots of things on there. Well, is this a UK thing or is it a European Union thing or is it, do you think it's a uh, more general? So the largest case that's happened was actually an American pizza company, okay. which uh, is known worldwide. Uh, so uh, I can't remember the exact situation, but uh, there was a partially blind man. He wanted to order a pizza, uh, but he wanted to put specific toppings on this pizza and the feature to add the specific toppings. Um, wasn't accessible he, he didn't know oh, okay. he chose uh and he took them to court and actually won uh oh. and during okay. that court case it was found out that actually most of the of this company's website couldn't be used by a lot of, I don't know, of uh, customers who needed um aids and online uh they needed these uh, this help when accessing a website. All right. So everyone who's watching and listening, ch- check your websites for accessibility <laughs> because it, it, could, it could cost you a lawsuit, which uh, nobody yes. wants. Mm-hmm. Um, at least get the basics. Um, all exactly. right. So um, in the show, I usually uh, at the end um, have some myths about the topic that um, I want to, to ask the guest speaker. So I have top three uh, myths of uh, about accessibility i would just uh present them to you and you would um help me find out if if it's a myth or a myth or if it's um if it's not so um, the first one is web accessibility negatively impacts great web design it can uh, uh this depends on the person designing the website. Okay. Uh, so uh, I won't put it down to the person's skills because I don't think it's down to their skills. Um, it comes with experience, I think. So if you just come across accessibility for the first time and you didn't want your company to have a lawsuit, uh, for example, you would try and come up with like the most obvious design that you can do uh, that stands out and looks like it is it's really simple. Um, as you improve, uh, as you progress over time, you'll start to realize that there's certain things that that you may think look ugly that you can then start to improve um, over that time period. Uh, and then when you're designing websites, you can you can actually design very modern websites. And if you're working with a front-end dev or if you're a front-end dev working with a a designer, if you work um, as a team, you can actually create some really nice looking websites and make them as uh, as accessible as you can. So uh, I know where that myth comes from. Uh, It it comes from uh, people being too scared basically to create nice uh, okay. designs so uh, so they try and make them uh, well they they think they're trying to make them accessible they think it looks and ugly but yeah um, it is one that that can work um, if you can do it by yourself that's great so I know a lot of people 
who can do this. You know, uh, there's a freelancer I know, I think you know as well. Uh, his name is Dan Spratling. Oh, yeah, Dan Spratling, uh, yes. Yeah, he's a fantastic dev and he's a fantastic uh, designer as well. And the websites he uh, designs look fantastic. And the code he writes, from what I can see, is very accessible as well. So, oh, nice. Uh, my hat's off to him. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, I think that um, is a myth. Uh, you can okay. create some nice websites. Okay. Um, second one only a small percentage of my users need an accessible website or application. So again, that myth has like a root. So the uh, so where this myth came from was you know oh not um, all of my users uh, or customers um, are blind. Not and all of them need a screen reader. So a screen reader tends to be like the most kind of popular example that people yeah. go for. Um, so that's where that that myth comes from, uh, but. Actually, um, all of the users do need uh, accessible help, uh, I guess. So whether that is a third-party tool, like a screen reader, for example, um, I can see fine. I mean, I know I have on these, uh, mm. but um, I can see fine. But um, on my Alexa, I actually have a skill, uh, and this skill recognizes when I'm stuttering to my Alexa because I I have a stutter, uh, as you probably yeah. uh, worked out. So that's that's a third-party tool um, that I've got on my Alexa, and that's not a website. That's, you know, something that I speak to. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would be a small percentage of those users who needs that third-party tool, but actually... Um, everyone stutters. Everyone has an, an accent. For example, I'm talking to Alexa, yeah. for example, Alexa needs to be able to understand everybody, uh, not just the you know, bog standard. She's speaking to me now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, so that's an example. I've turned you off. I'm going to take the plug out. So. Uh, <laughs> So that's an example. That's not actually a website, but it's it's where yes. they need to in, encounter everybody um, at the same time. Um, if you made a website and it was yellow with lime green text, would you be able to read that? And the answer yeah. would be no. Uh, yeah. And you know, do you need a screen? <laughs> And do you normally use a screen reader? You know, they'd say no, but to read this lime green text, they would probably need a screen reader to help them uh, yeah. because it would be quite difficult. So uh, I think I mentioned this at the start. It all depends on, on who the person is, uh, what kind of product you, you've got, what kind of website. Uh, Etc. But uh, that um, is a myth. Uh, One hundred percent of people need uh, those features enabled or available to them. I should say. Yeah. All right. Um, now the last one. Um, it will take too much time, effort, and or money to make a website accessible. There's those memes um, online in there, but <laughs> like. Uh, if you make uh it's like if you want to make a cheap an app it will take you a long time and a lot um, of effort uh if you want to make a quick app uh then it'll be expensive to do uh, etc and it's like those are charts going to keep moving around um i'd say to do the research so if you're making your own custom component, for example, most of the work goes into the actual research around what you actually need to do. 
um, the person doing that re that research, uh, obviously the company pays them, so you know they they pay them that time. Uh, so you know I get paid uh, seven and a half hours a day if I spend two hours during that day researching something. Then I, then I then I get paid for it. Uh, yeah. And that is a cost that the company has. Um, it's all dependent on you know the size of your company and what and what risks that company is willing to take. Uh, like we spoke about and earlier. Um, yeah. I don't know whether to call that one a myth. Uh, I think there's some truth in it. Uh, mm -hmm. It does require some extra time, some extra. An effort. If you have people in your company who already know how to do this stuff, then obviously that makes it better. But they will always come across something that they don't know, and they've got to still spend that time yeah. on. So, yeah, I'm reluctant to, to call that one a myth. Uh, there's there's a bit of truth in it. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right. Um... That's uh, the things I wanted to ask you. Do you maybe have something that you want to um, tell the audience about accessibility or in general, some message you want to give the audience? Uh, yeah, sort of. When you're researching about Emma Ali and you're looking at all these articles online, uh, be sure to check the resource that you're actually looking at. Um, there's a lot of outdated resources on there which actually don't apply um, anymore. Uh, there's a lot of resources that I found. Um, it's harsh to say, but they're just plain wrong. Uh, and, you know, you can tell that this person hasn't done any research um, into what they are saying. So make sure that when you find or find a resource that you can actually find multiple resources that back up, you know, the argument that the other ones okay. are trying to make. So that's something I do. I have come across a lot of resources in the past. I've tried to implement what they, they've told me and I've actually gone, that's not right at all. <laughs> so, uh, Yes, yeah, so I would definitely do that. Um, one um, other thing is don't fall into the trap of being too obsessive. Um, I once fell into that trap of being too obsessive about it. And like that third myth, you know, it can cost a lot yeah. of time uh, to be very obsessive about it. Definitely be passionate, uh, but don't be obsessive. Okay. <laughs> nice those are some nice words to end this uh, episode thank you very much Jack for coming on the show and for taking time out of your schedule and for answering all the questions thank you for having me I loved it okay bye bye Jack bye bye everyone yes. bye. thanks for tuning in and watching the video till the end please give a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button and I hope to see you next Monday Thank you for watching Decoding the Code. A new episode will be available every week. So don't forget to tune in next Monday. For past episodes, check out the website, decoding.show. <laughs>